Welcome to Selecting the Ideal Data Structure, Dictionaries and Arrays. My name is Chris, and I will be your guide. In this course, you'll learn about how common abstract data types are used in Python, with a focus on dictionaries and maps, and array structures. Just a quick note, all the code in here was tested using Python 3.9. Almost all the concepts discussed have been here from Python's early days, so you should be able to use it with older versions without a problem. I'll do my best to point out differences between the versions as I go along. There are many different ways of organizing your data when you write code. Choosing the right data structures is important. Different kinds of structures have different purposes, strengths, and weaknesses. Python being a batteries included language means that most common data structures are provided with the language itself. And as you'll discover in this course, there's often multiple different structures within Python to solve the same kinds of problems. This course is going to focus on two kinds of data structures. The first is dictionaries, and the second is arrays. Dictionaries and data maps store key value pairs and the relationship between them. This is a way of grouping fields that are related together in the same data structure. The creators of Python felt that this data structure was so important, they've included it as a built-in type called dict. Over and on top of that though, there are also other dictionaries and maps inside of the standard library. Ordered dict, default dict, chain map, and mapping proxy type will all be covered in this course. At the end of the section on dictionaries, I'll discuss how to choose which implementation to use and give you some further information. The second section of the course is on arrays. An array is a continuous chunk of memory storing a series of items. Python has two built-in types, list and tuple, that are implemented as arrays. Both of these types can take any kind of data inside of them. In addition to that, there's a standard library called array that provides typed arrays. If you're looking to manipulate binary data, the bytes and byte array types are available to help you do this. And at the end of the section on arrays, I'll discuss how to choose between these implementations and what's best for your situation. That's enough preamble. Next up, let's dive into dictionaries. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'm going to start to the section on dictionaries and focus on the built-in type called dict. The purpose of a dictionary is to store data by mapping a key to a value. Some examples of this are mapping a name to a phone number or an IP address to a domain name. Given a key store like this, you could take the name from the data, look it up, and get the phone number as a result. Same with the IP address and the domain name. Dictionary data structures are known by a bunch of different names in computer science. Python uses the native term dict for this kind of data structure, but other languages will refer to these as maps, hash maps, lookup tables, and associative arrays. Python builds the dict type straight into the language, and in fact does more than that. A lot of class concepts and other ideas inside of Python are built on top of the dict. It's one of the most fundamental aspects of the language at the heart of its implementation. Python uses curly braces to indicate a dictionary. Here's an example of a dictionary mapping people's names to their phone extensions. This dictionary contains three keys, the strings Bob, Alice, and Janet, and each key maps to a four-digit number, the extension. Inside of the REPL, if I type the name of the phone book, it gives me what's called a wrapper, or the representation of that. It's an automatic way of translating something to a string that shows you, typically for debug purposes, the contents of the data structure. I can access any one of the keys by referencing it using square brackets and the name of the key. Here I'm accessing Alice and getting back the result 3719, the extension mapped to Alice in the dictionary. If I try to ask for a key that's not there, I'll get an exception. The exception is a key error, indicating that that key does not exist inside of the dictionary. 
In addition to using the square brackets to access a key, I can use the get method on the dictionary. This ends up with the same result, returning the 3719 mapped to the key Alice. Get is subtly different from using the square brackets in that it doesn't actually trigger a key error. If I call get with Fred, I get back nothing. The REPL doesn't show you none when you get none back, so I have to print it in order for you to see that. So depending on what you're trying to do in your code, you can either use the get method and check for none when it comes back, or you can use a try accept block to catch any sort of key errors. The get method has an optional second parameter that allows you to specify the default value to come back instead of none if the key is not there. This is a really handy way of getting something out of a dictionary and returning a default value if the key didn't exist. This is far more succinct than using a try catch block, catching the key error, and then returning a value. Running the length function on phonebook returns the number of keys in the phonebook, in this case three. I can see all of the keys in the phonebook using the keys method on the dictionary. This returns a special generator called dict keys, which contains the values of Bob, Alice, and Janet. If you iterate over the return value of this function, you will get the keys themselves. In addition to having a keys method, the dictionary also has a values method. This is a similar idea, but instead of spitting back the keys, it spits back the values. If you want to iterate over both the keys and the values, the items method allows you to do this. A common pattern for using this iterator is inside of a for loop getting both the key and the value out of a function and doing something with the contents. Here, I'm getting back two values, the name and the extension, from each turn through the iteration. I can then print those out to the screen and get back all of the keys and values. In addition to explicitly defining the values like I did in the phone book, Python supports a mechanism called comprehensions. A comprehension is a way of doing a calculation that results in a dictionary. Assume for the moment you had a list of tuples with the names and ranks of your favorite Star Trek characters. A dictionary comprehension constructs the dictionary based on some calculation. The comprehension looks like a bit of a combination between the iterator part of a for loop and the brace brackets themselves for a dictionary. When trying to understand a comprehension, I like to start from the outsides of the sandwich. On the left side, you see name colon rank. That says you're going to be creating some key value terms, in this case based on the ideas of the variables name and rank. On the other end of the sandwich, on the right-hand side of the statement, is the ranks list, which is defined above. So you know that you're going to be creating the dictionary based on the contents of ranks. The middle part of the sandwich is similar to a for loop. It creates two variables, name and rank, based on iterating over the ranks list. And the resulting dictionary shows a mapping between the names and ranks of Star Trek characters. Let's take a look at another comprehension, this time with a calculation in it. Once again, start on the left-hand side. This says it's going to be creating a dictionary mapping x to the value of x times x, the square of x. On the right-hand side, you can see that you're going to be mapping values in the return from the function range 6. That's the values from 0 to 5. Range is not inclusive. The middle part of the comprehension says loop over those values. The end result, 0 mapping to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 4, 3 to 9, 4 to 16, and 5 to 25. The value and its corresponding square.
You can't just use anything for a key in Python dictionaries. Keys must be hashable. Something is hashable in Python if it's immutable, which means it can't change during its lifetime, and it implements double underscore hash and can be compared with double underscore equals. The most important part of this is two values that are equal end up in having the same hash value. That way, when key values are pushed into the dictionary and accessed using a different variable with the same contents, the result gets returned. Common hashable types built into Python are strings, numbers, and tuples of other hashable types. If you stick to these kinds of keys, you don't have to worry about double underscore hash or double underscore equal. But if you're going to build your own objects that you want to be hashable, then you'll have to go off and implement those dunder methods. As I mentioned earlier, the dict type is a foundational part of Python, and it's key to how Python actually implements a lot of concepts inside of the language. As a result, it's highly optimized and written to be very performant. The attributes of a class and stack frames inside of an execution stack both use the dict type inside of Python. A particular emphasis has been put on performance for the dictionary. It is order one complexity for lookup, insert, update, and delete operations. That's about as good as it gets. In addition to the built-in type, Python has other kinds of dictionaries as well. In the next lesson, I'll be talking about the ordered dict and the default dict.